Okay, back to work. So um, after talking about workflows in Herbarium and workflows and you know vertebrate mm -hmm. uh, collections essentially, we're now back to insect specimens. And just to you know, remind you, obviously the challenges there are small, fragile, and many. I think this sort of is you know the core of um, the things we have to consider. Also because I think the actual data, the electronic data capture is very similar for a lot of us. I will do something a little similar to what Town did, which is I'm going to be focusing on some of the pre-digitization um, pre curation ideas and things to consider. So I'm not claiming it's going to be comprehensive, but just certain things that I think are important to, to think about. Um, when you look at insect collections, the great majority of material is going to look like that. So it's going to be dry and prepared in different ways, but dry in, in unit, what we call unit trays. It would be a unit tray. The entire thing is called an insect drawer. Then you have a much smaller, um, a much smaller proportion of insect collections that will look like that. So you have a microscopic slide and it can sit in trays like that or towards the end of my presentation I'm actually going to be showing you two videos not done by me or people in my lab but done by InvertNet. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's not us who stole that name. It's the InvertNet people. <laughs> I'm not responsible. I'm not aligned with them in any way. <laughs> So they put together really nice videos and how they're dealing with the workflow of capturing data from microscopic slide collections. And the same for fluid preserved specimens. Again, as opposed to what you might think of in vertebrate collections, you know, big fish and you know, big things swimming around in big jars. What we're dealing with is this. So we have tiny little vials typically um, labeled in certain ways, and then we store and stack them in ways like that. That's an example from my own lab. Um, and this is really only a small, relatively small research collection um, of material, but obviously different challenges for all of those. Okay, I want to follow up on something that Melissa mentioned earlier on, and you've seen that chart before. So that chart is one of the, you know, it came through IDIG Bio, just to you know, keep reinforcing these abbreviations and acronyms. And it was actually published in um, a publication I make sure you all will have access to as well. Again, it comes out of the 3D online available Suki's volume on collection digitization. And it was put together by Nelson et al. And really what they did, they looked Again, uh, Melissa explained most of that. Um, they looked into the workflows that can happen in collections or should happen in collections. They come, came up with different ways and you know, observing people actually doing the work. They came up with different ways of classifying them. And then what they did too is they came up with these five distinct clusters of things that typically happen during a dig digitization. So you have the pre-digitization, curation, and staging of the specimens. And then those are not necessarily in chronological order, as you're going to be seeing in a second. You have specimen imaging capture, specimen image processing, electronic data capture, and then georeferencing locality descriptions. So we're going to be having a full day of talking about yeah. georeferencing on Saturday, obviously. The imaging we will cover tomorrow. So I'm really only going to be looking at pre-digitization curation and the electronic data capture. And then also to just briefly um, you know, I'm confused where on the slides I have certain pieces of information, but let's just briefly look at that again. So really, it's not that much of a difference. So in all these three workflows you see here, there's always pre-digitization curation comes first, obviously, that's very simple. And then they're really differing in the order and in a way the data capture versus imaging really happens. So in this case, you would capture the data first and then the data is being output it through the World Wide Web or data aggregators, whatever you want to use, or in-house usage or storage, obviously. And then you're going to be picking exemplar specimens for imaging, process the images, and store these images. So it's sort of a little bit, you know, it's, it's not a completely separate process for the two, but it's certainly not as separate as here, where really you're treating the data capture as one workflow, and then you're treating the capture imaging as another. So this is what we're using in our TCN project really. We're capturing data 
and then the uh, um, capturing images and processing images. It's done by a different, even a different group of people in most cases. So they are re very separate workflows. And then you can have this one down here, and this is what you're going to be seeing from microscopic slides, for example, but then also for some of the fluid preserved collections. And again, the example here is invert net, where after pre-digitization, it goes straight to image capture, you process the images, store the images, and then that obviously allows other people to get access to the images too, and then you actually date, uh, capture the data from them, and then you output everything together. Okay, so what I'm going to be focusing on for the next little while is data capture and pinned insects, some considerations, fluid preserved specimens, and then slide mounted insects. And all the imaging part I'm going to be leaving for tomorrow. And again, what I'm going to be saying about it tomorrow is going to be very specific to small, small animals, put it that way. I don't want to say insects, it's true for other arthropods and, and other invertebrates as well, but it's for small things. Okay, so I mentioned that before, pre-digitization, electronic data capture, and again, an um, um, image of the, um, of the specimen database we're using. Um, and I'm really only going to be highlighting a few other things in the actual data capture process that I felt I glossed over the last few days or just simply forgot. So there will be more as we go. Okay, so when you start thinking about digitizing your invertebrate collections, there's a few questions you want to ask yourself. So the first question to me is, are the specimens properly prepared? Are they pin, point mounted, etc.? And are they labeled in an appropriate way? Which means, do they have you know, the minimum core information, which is locality information collector, and so on and so forth. And I'm saying that because obviously we all come back from the field, we have our big typically our big plastic bags full of specimens. And at that stage, they really can't be digitized in any straightforward way. So you can maybe lock them into an Excel spreadsheet as field samples, and we typically do some of that just to keep track of some of the valuable ethanol specimens we have collected. But in order to actually fully digitize them, this is not really a stage to do them. Then the other thing, and again, this is a huge difference, obviously, compared to vertebrate collection, at least bird collection. I don't really want to generalize for you know, some of the fishes and, and amphibians. They have different challenges, too. But then also, uh, as compared to the, um, the botanical world, really, so in our case, having a species-level identified collection is a luxury. <laughs> so this is something that takes a lot of effort a lot of time and many, many years until you get from a essentially field collected sample of specimens to something that is identified to the species level. Lots of effort. Okay, and finally I want um, to think about how do you want to organize your specimens within the collection to really make the workflows maximally efficient? And there's ways of doing that as well. Okay, um, pre-digitization, curation, really that means those are the three big topics you want to consider. Now they're not phrased as questions, but they're you know, phrased as actual bullet points to do things. Specimen preservation labeling, you want to check that. Check specimen identification and check organization. Okay, starting off with, so for this part, I'm really focusing on dry insect specimens because we're gonna be handling fluid and microscopic um, preserved slides a little bit separately. So there are certain standards out there, essentially, on how you're you know, preferably supposed to be um, preparing your insect specimens. So what our museum does, for example, because we're in a research, a big entomological department, a big research institution, we have about 30 laboratories with a lot of you know, um, faculty and postdocs and graduate students researching on insects. And a lot of these people need to deposit voucher specimens for some of their projects, and they use our museum to do so. So those are essentially people who are not trained and skilled in taxonomy systematics at all, but we want to make sure that the specimens they give to us and deposit in the museum are up to research quality specimen standards, essentially. So their document is really quite important. And for those of you who are interested, this is freely available from our web page as well under the resources that we have for the Entomological Research Museum. So this is really quite useful. Just make sure you, you know, tell people what they need to consider really. 
So there's a few really simple things. Some of them are, you know, they're just standardized to make everyone's life a little bit easier. And in most cases, the pinning really should happen such that you make sure that you know, the, uh, the specimen obviously is well preserved, it's not going to be falling off the point and things like that. But then also to make sure you're not destroying important parts of the insect specimen that you, you know, a researcher who comes along wants to identify it, for example, might need to be able to see in exactly the, you know, the medial part of, let's say, the pronotum or the prosternum, sorry, but then if you put a pin right through the center of the insect specimen, that might just be broken and it might be destroyed. So this is why one of the really easy strategies is you always put your point through the specimen off center to make sure that you know, whatever structure you might be you know, destroying down here, because the specimen obviously is symmetrical, you will have another opportunity on the other side to see that. So it's very simple strategies and things like that. It's, there's lots of, as I said, lots of guides out there. Most general entomology textbooks will have a small section on how to properly prepare insects. And you know, we do that for a reason, obviously. For small insects, there are other strategies. Obviously, small insects are very fragile. And obviously, it's difficult to get them prepared in such ways that you're not you know, drowning the entire specimen in a gob of glue essentially and put it on a cart because if the specimen is emerged in glue you can't really study it. You might not be able to even identify the genus in many cases. So this is why we're what we call point mount these tiny little insects and this looks like that. So it's just a tiny little drop of glue. We use white glue so something really simple that you can buy very easily in a store and you put a tiny little bit on it and then the specimen gets attached on the thorax on one side. And again, we're trying to obviously you know, capitalize on the fact that those are symmetrical specimens. So you're putting the point on the right side of the thorax, but you still have the other side you can study and observe. Okay, the other thing, and this is actually um, another important thing for the, for the label to keep in consideration. Typically, we move the label up quite closely to the point because that actually protects the specimen from underneath. So we have the point, the specimen sitting on it, and then the label protecting it from below. There's some other, you know, a lot of older specimens you will see, for example, mounted like that. I hide those things. They're called minutin pins. They're really super tiny, fine pins, and you can do a lot of damage with them. <laughs> so a friend of mine, just because they're so super fine and tiny, they're very difficult to handle. They cling to glasses and all sorts of things. So a friend of mine flipped one up while preparing tiny little flies, and he got one of them into his eyeball, and it was not a pleasant experience. I sat off one of them at one point, and that's not pleasant either. So there are certain things you don't want to do. So we're doing the point mounting, which is also um, more pragmatic, cheaper, typically. Okay, there's a few other things, and this might look to you very finicky, little details about right, wrong, wrong, right, wrong, wrong, but again, there's obvious reasons why we're saying this is wrong, this is wrong. Can anyone imagine why this might not be a good way of preparing your specimen? Yes? Yeah, that's one thing. And what might be another reason you end up, you know, you end up with problems potentially if the specimen is sitting so low on the on the pin. So think of the number of labels that end up on a lot of these specimens. So again, one of the things is obviously and we heard that with the whole drawer digitization approaches, it's a nice idea to have a label spaced out. But in many cases, and the arthropod people are gonna be seeing that this afternoon too, you end up with like five, six, seven, eight labels. So the higher you have the specimen, so it shouldn't be too high, so you still have to be comfortably be able to grip the pin and the specimen without touching and damaging it, obviously. But you want to have enough space so you can put several labels underneath it. And then um, this is really something that's quite obvious, so especially in the age where we're trying to image a lot of specimens. If you have a specimen crooked like that, it's just a nightmare to, um, to image, obviously, because you're ending up with things in focus and other body parts not in focus. Very obvious. Okay, so you could you know, obviously keep talking about how to prepare insect specimens properly for 
long periods of time. This is what we typically do in our in the insect biodiversity class I'm teaching. We typically devote an entire or well, half a lab, like one and a half hours, to you know going through the protocols and showing sp um, students how to prepare them, and then they have to start building their own collection based on these criteria. Okay, um, that's supposed to mean um, slide-mounted specimens and not side-mounted specimens. Um, please apologies for my, I want to apologize for my uh, misspelling there. So the challenges there are obviously different. So one of the problems that happen with slide-mounted specimens quite a bit is that the mounting medium in all times that was often higher, there are other, um, um, other um, media that are, have been used as well, it deteriorates and it can start looking like that, which obviously is a bad thing. So this would be, you know, that's the entire microscopic slide. You have your tiny little specimen somewhere in here. You have a cover, a round cover slip on it, and you can see that the medium discolored completely. So if, you know, for you, in order to actually see the specimen, you have to crank up the light source on your microscope a lot, and even then you might not be able to see things. Then also, some of the older mounting mediums didn't really have very good properties, optical properties. So they, the optical properties of these media, they're very different from what glass is like. And obviously, the more fractions you have in the light going through your object, the less high quality your image is going to be. So really, what you want to consider is you want to look for a medium that has properties that are very similar to those of glass. So this is why now people typically, for insect collections at least, they typically use Canada balsam to embed their specimens. Another thing, and this luckily didn't happen here, but what you see a lot in all the collections is that cover slides just break. And that means the specimens become exposed, they could even fall out of the medium and be gone. And obviously if this is types, it's a horrible thing. Um, so what, if you have a slide collection, what you really might have to consider is that you might have to recurate the collection, make sure it has appropriate medium, um, and then also new covers if this is necessary. Of course, this is a really, really, really involved project, and this is not something you can just do on the side, really. So it costs a lot of time, it costs a lot of money as well, and there I'm getting a break. <laughs>